The Forgotten Minotaur King Side Story The Attack on Mendes Castle Part 4 Fugazi's alchemically enhanced body dove past many of the Morongo Knight Valwen's strikes. However, several successfully connected. The mutant satyr felt pain lancing through his body from various wounds the lightning-fast maneuvers of the polearm had left. Unable to get a hold of Valwen, both due to the knight's dexterous movements that nearly matched his own, but also due to his sharply barbed armor that the human was adorned in, which somehow didn't manage to slow his movements. This cocky manling was supernaturally gifted, Fugazi was sure of it. As he was backed into yet another of the knight's bystanding subordinates, Fugazi broke the superfluous onlooking knight's neck. This also didn't seem to phase the whirling dervish in Brown's light plate. You are finished, monster. Let my men leave, and we may spare your life. As Valwen made the declaration, Fugazi turned to see several soldiers following who he assumed was a captain, like the night woman he had originally started this duel with. They were making their way over the freshly blasted rubble towards the main castle courtyard, away from the library tower that they had likely infiltrated through. If he survived the brazen, blonde human, he was going to have words with Lord Carniger. It should have been him who'd cleared up this mess. Fugazi had even already lost the prisoner, Aksur. Cursing under his breath and ashamed he'd been put on the back foot so thoroughly, Fugazi once again put his hands up in the universal gesture of surrender. Hey, hey, okay? You got some moves, alright? I'll give you that. Why don't you come work for me, big guy, huh? My boss out of Mentirosa City down south would love to have a guy like you, huh? What do you say? For a moment, Fugazi thought he'd take the deal as that damn smirk crept across the annoying handsome lad's face. Fugazi was also a little off-put by how often the kid seemed to be looking past him at his men, but the satyr didn't sense any attack from his rear during their duel. Without another word, Valwen put his spear onto a holster clip located somewhere on his back and stood tall in front of the satyr assassin. Maybe I'll take your opponent's offer someday, but I believe our work is complete. Au revoir, Leche. Running past the blue-skinned and avian-headed monster, Valwen let out a sharp wolf whistle. The remaining skeletal warriors he commanded their numbers now reduced to under half of the dozen that initiated the attack, turned from the battle, along with the five or six men that didn't follow Captain Elysio forward into the main courtyard. Lastly were the three surviving grenadiers that had successfully finished the greater distraction and revenge as ordered by Captain Ghislaine during her escape with the prisoner. As they exited the dungeon, a relieved but bewildered Fugazi looked on, scratching his beak with a growing concern. As they cleared the door, Lieutenant Artois gave the order, and the dungeon erupted in a massive explosion. Myrink's shots went a bit wide of the massive captain of the half-orc guards, Hansk. Three went into the wall of the stairwell. One grazed the shoulder pauldrons of Hansk's armor, letting out a deafening ring, and the last two struck one of the ogres paired, bracketing the stairwell. The wounded ogre doubled over onto the carpet. One bullet had pierced his chest, causing him to have a coughing fit as it seemed to have punctured a lung, and the other obliterated the ogre's left ear, which spouted blood, but didn't seem to concern the brute. Shielding his face, 
the unwounded ogre began to barrel towards the mouseling hitwoman and her three recently freed captives. Perna, the babysitter, clutched court to her chest and began to flee back to the halls that they had just left. Swari Chungus ducked behind the still-disguised Myrink, completely unaware it was her sister that she had to thank for her recent freedom. Aiming the fresh revolver at the stampeding wall of muscle, Myrink fired three shots into his tallow right knee, while not utterly dismembering the limb as the force of the shot would have any normal humanoid target, the ogre did stop in his tracks and clutch his leg in pain. Howling, Myrink sought to silence the dolt for the shot to his unguarded head. With a loud crack, the ogre's head whipped back, and as he fell to the floor, the room shook from his size. Perna, get back here with baby court. I promised kind I would rescue you, and I intend to. Firing more suppression shots in the direction of Hansk, who was now fully hiding behind the still hacking and coughing ogre. She cleared the way for her and her party's advance. As they moved past the ogre whose leg and head she'd shot, they could still hear the monstrous man groaning in pain. Myrink thought to herself that all those days ago, she had made the right move not helping their temporary companion Dar when these freaks had slaughtered him in the forest, if not even a headshot could finish them. Still, drawing down on Hansk, they closed the distance to a few feet. Now was the time for a bold move. She put herself directly between the party and the half-orc as they closed in on the stairway. Now, now, go, go, go! Aiming her gun for a now near point-blank shot at Hansk, Swari and Perna fled to safely down the stairs. Why, you little rat! I'll cut you! He leapt from the bowed ogre's back, Myrink's shots firing directly into his chest armor, piercing it, but not strongly enough to deter his fury. Grabbing her hands in his fists three times the size of her mouseling palms, she could feel her fingers pulverizing under the green-skinned half-human's grip. Her guns dropped to the carpeted floor. The last thing she remembered before the half-orc Hansk headbutted her into unconsciousness, then falling to the ground succumbing to his own wounds, was hearing the sound of a crying baby minotaur retreating down the stairs, safely back to his father, she hoped. Captain Alicio Laris climbed the rubble out of the dungeon, confident his lieutenant would get the better of that blue devil he was locked in combat with. Five men accompanied him as he fled forward to aid the ex Lavrida Cher Mousling, tasked with rescuing the diplomat's wife. This mission had gone less than optimally thus far, but with the successful extraction of the prisoner, if his faith in his co-captain was as well placed as he'd hoped, this would be a major victory for the Morongo Knights. They exited the dungeon, a single grenadier with this new detachment told Alicio this was a one-way trip, as Captain Galane had told them to demolish the dungeon in revenge. He knew the woman could run hot-blooded, but that was absolutely cheeky. They were met with a single half-orc fellow staring at the collapsed Porcullus he seemed to have been tasked with guarding. Making quick work of the unfortunate guardsmen, the men continued forward into the primary courtyard. Onlookers and workers from all around began to come and mill about. Fortunately, very few took notice of the guards as they crept along the castle walls, having spotted the main entrance. Surreptitiously avoiding a few more guards that began to disperse the crowd, vehemently warning of the incoming arrival of the prince and princess, Alicio thought what a true blow it would be if they managed to kidnap 
of Regella Saad or Pogus Royal, but remembered that the actions of the Morongo Knights were currently only partially sanctioned by the governance of Monchen. When Valuen had taken the assignment, it was under an unspoken understanding that if they were captured or killed, their ties to their greater government of Andron would be disavowed. That would become significantly more impossible to excuse if enemy country royalty was being directly involved. Elysio and company made it to the main entrance, where they were nearly immediately greeted by a screaming mouseling, along with a very young elven girl with a minotaur calf strapped to her chest. Oh, mon dieu, Captain Elysio, get me out of here quickly! Swore Chungus leapt into his arms. The men snickered as Elysio bashfully put her back on the ground and checked her safely. He looked around for the Myrink girl, but didn't see her accompanying them, then looked down at the scared but deeply saddened faces of the captives. He feared the worst. He decided the best course of action was to secure the target, just as Ghislaine had. The moment they turned to the door to flee, an enormous explosion rang out through the halls of the castle. Elysio smiled to himself and fled with everyone in tow back to the university. Lord Natanus Carniger held the squealing mouseling by the ears, his rotund frame seemingly weightless in the grip of the vampire lord. He stared at the ailing frame of the female knight lying halfway into his courtyard. He thanked his lucky stars he'd sealed the doors to the library. No telling what this brute may have done to his students. Looking down to his side, he remembered Bicel's friend was still under his watch, the half-dwarven girl Norge Rau. He would need to secure her safety before getting to work on this night, and her compatriots in the dungeon that would replenish his thrall ranks. Sorry you had to be here for this, young Miss Rau, but I'll clean up this mess very quickly. The wriggling and writhing form of Aksur clutched something in his pocket and began to scream. Monsieur Valier, please save yourself. I'll stop him. And please, save my wife. Ghislaine was just beginning to feel strength return to her leg as the horrific frame of the vampire began to creepily glide towards her. She wasn't sure if she'd heed Aksur's words or try even in her weakened state to complete the mission. Attempting to stand like a newly born calf, Ghislaine wobblingly managed to get onto her feet and began hobbling towards the library's outer walls. She heard a dry chuckle from behind her as the gliding gait of Natanis crept closer and closer. When she was close enough to the wall, she produced the grappling rope which moments ago she was prepared to give to Aksur so he could save himself. Swinging it successfully onto the wall, the moment Carniger's gnarled free hand reached out for her. This was Aksur's moment, his time to be a hero. He hoped his people, the ones he tried to free from Rajalasad rule, would sing songs of how he went to jail for them and killed a vampire for them. Producing the last flash bomb Ghislaine had given him, he tossed it onto the ground, directly at the feet of the shadow wreathed vampire lord, Natanis. The glare nearly blinded him and he could see the strange half-dwarven girl he'd seen from his cell a number of times, also narrowly avoid being blinded by the bomb. Carniger let out a monstrous hissing screech, which did deafen Oxor. 
burning his ears even more than hanging from them currently had. But to his surprise, unlike the thralls that had attacked them before, Carnager didn't glow like a fiery log and pop the moment his protective shadow wards dispelled. He simply began to slowly cook, completely abandoning the chase of Ghislaine. He flew towards the doors of the library. The half-dwarven girl gave chase behind him. Just as a massive explosion from where the dungeon tower stood rang out, aiding to Carnager's fleeing speed. Bursting through the entry, Aksor was greeted by the face of the human and draconid lads he'd seen several times during his incarceration. Carnager continued to hiss in pain. He even flung the mouseling into the pair of desks he'd laid out that morning for his workers turned students. <laughs> Master myself. Master Chinook aid me. My blood supply in the dimension door. Otherwise, I might train someone in this room dry. Aksor clutched his bruised side as he tried to untangle himself from the desks. Being sure not to draw attention to himself after the vampire's last comments, the draconid boy was the first to go, fleeing for the blood. The human just looked at Aksor, horrified, then to the dwarven girl, equally shocked and seemingly ashamed. A moment or so passed before Natanis tried to speak, still waiting for the draconid to return. It seems there was an attack. This fellow was who they fought to rescue. Once I'm replenished, I'll go and finish this rescue party, as it were, and I'll bring one back alive for questioning. The human once again looked horrified. Aksor was about to plead for his life once again, certain that at least the knight that had rescued him was safe. When the doors of the library once again smashed open, but in the entryway stood a knight with flowing dark auburn hair in burnt brass-colored barbed plate. Lord Carnager reeled back in a hiss as the knight tossed a massive and heavy fauchard like a light javelin directly into the vampire, piercing him through the lower abdomen and pinning the ancient lord directly into a shelf of books which toppled to the floor, Carnager still attached. Valuan spotted the desks Aksor was still partially entangled in. Reaching out a hand, Aksor pleadingly offered a paw, but Valuan reached past the tubby startled mouseling and broke a hefty leg from one of the desks, silently walking back to the captured vampire who still fruitlessly tried to remove Valwen's judgment's fang from his stomach. With a hefty thrust, Valwen jammed the wooden chair leg in to Natanis Carnager Half-Elven's heart. Hi, my name is Matthew Lewis, and I do the voice of Kaisel Bakshi, along with all the additional voices in The Forgotten Minotaur King. I hope you enjoy the podcast and continue to listen into the future. If you want to support my content, please donate to my Patreon, Matthew Lewis Podcasts. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Matthew Lewis Podcasts, all one word. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Matthew Lewis P. Or leave a positive maximum star review on your podcast app of choice. If you found this podcast, I assume you're familiar enough with the genre to know how important reviews are to the survival of a channel. Uh, and I hope you recommend this to your friends. Or if you didn't like it, uh, you could recommend it to your enemies, and I'll teach them a lesson. Uh, keep it sleazy, folks, and thank you.